Yes, it is a reawakening. La Pepe Negra, Negro Casas. I have found this beautiful redeprehension, a new appreciation of La Pepe Negra, Negro Casas, Felino, and Mr. Niebla. Kurt, you handle the intros. Okay, Fredo. Ladies and gentlemen, this is Vandal Drummond, or the many ways it has been misspelled throughout the years, along with Alfredo Esparza for a new edition of Slam and Stam. Hey, I got it right in the first one, Fredo. I know. There you go. And this time we didn't even complain about the music starting. Yeah. Whoa. It's almost creepy how it came off without a hitch. I think we're catching up to all this technology now. <laughs> Between, I feel uh, so Neanderthal. Between Blog Talk Radio and uh, Twitter, I'm on a roll this week. You're actually ahead of me. I'm still uh, I'm still mastering Facebook, and you are now on Twitter. So you can now tweet Alfredo on Twitter. Yeah, you could tweet me at the real Fredo. That's my tweet. That's my account name, the real Fredo. Just so check this man out, one. ladies and gentlemen. Just in case there's a fake one, I've already made sure that I'm the legit one. The real Alfredo Esparza. So don't don't look for for Alfredo Esparza double zero one or something like that. Go to the source, and you can find me on Facebook. Just look for Vandal Drummond. I'll pop up somewhere around there, or you can email me at liger. That's L Y G E R at A O L dot com. Yeah, any comments, critics, criticism, anything about this um, podcast? Just send them to Kurt. Yes. He will, send he everything to me. He will read them and cry. I will read them and but, cry, but no, actually, I'll cry tears of joy because uh, most of my emails these days are nothing but spam. Oh, there you go. I think the most humiliating one was uh, a month or so back. I see, hey, Kurt, there are other senior singles in your area who want to get to know you. <laughs> <laughs> Did you reply? <laughs> No, I just sat there and felt about uh, 70 or 80 years old. Well, at least you're not getting the the, the the penis enlargement ones. Are you still getting those? Haven't gotten those. I guess I convinced them that I'm satisfied with what I got. So let's start about, did you hear about the news about the two minis, the mini luchadors? Yes, I did. Fill people in on the story. What happened here? Well, they found, um, I guess it was on Monday Monday morning, like at 6, 6 a.m., La Parquita, who's, I guess, the original, and Espectrito number two. Yes. We're, we're, coming, we're going to the, a hotel near Arena Coliseo, where they, where they were bringing along a couple of women that, I guess, we could, I guess we could say they were prostitutes. Ladies and, of the night. Yep. And at the very, I guess, like at 6 p.m., the women, the women left, and... I guess right after that, the the guy, I guess the manager decided that it was time to clean up the room. And you know the rest of the story. They found here at um, Espectrito number two and La Partita dead in the hotel room. And what they're presuming is that the prostitutes drugged them and robbed them. Which is, I guess, a common thing now in Mexico. Wow. Now, it... <laughs> It sounds it sounds disturbingly like the plot of an old Fonto movie, a bit darker version. But it just sounds like Law and Order, uh, like one of the <laughs> you know one of the CSI episodes where they're doing like a Halloween special. Yeah, and I don't mean to laugh at this, but it's just when you think you just when you think you've heard every disturbing, crazy, obscene story in the world of professional wrestling, that story gets outdone. I know, seriously, and, and I mean it could get worse, you know. What if these aren't women? <laughs> you know, <laughs> it could get worse. You never. Yeah, know. It could be. Yeah. Well, no. Well, I mean. Well, I mean, think about it. I mean, basically, could you imagine the stories that you could get just from Espectrito Two and uh, La Partita, considering they they were brothers, and they were basically they had one hotel room. I mean, what sharing kind of, prostitutes? I know. Seriously, it's like they must have had or, multiple orgies at. at yeah, years. and well, like. Well, we were talking about all those various urban myths or urban myths that were not myths last week on Slam and Stan. And uh, oddly enough, I bet you this isn't the strangest of them. I think there's been a number of wrestling brothers who have shared, uh, who have had sexual escapades in front of each other. 
Yeah, I mean, it's just, it just gets, it, it could get worse, but at the same time, it's just, it's just the craziest <coughs> thing. I mean, dragging two little midgets, I mean, La Parquita was little too, so it's like, how much, wow, how wow. Much, I mean, I don't know how much, how much drugs they must have poured in his drink or whatever, but it's, that's, that was my first question, was, were they drugged with the intention of, well, I think them they were passing gonna... out, or were they drugging them to intentionally kill them? Was I it just they... an accidental overdose they yeah. gave them? I, 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 we haven't gotten to that point, but I, I'm pretty sure they were drugging them just to rob them, to steal whatever they could. Wow. Because they, they, they said they, that the guy that they were interviewing said that he saw them carrying a bag with them. So I'm guessing they might have car- they might have stolen and uh, some whatever they had with them. Yeah, that sounds like the likely uh, the yeah, likely yeah. scenario. The weird thing was, like, the whole debate of who, which many of these guys were. You know, like, is this La Partita the original? Was this the independent one? Was this the AAA one? Was, was and you know how I how I pay attention to those details very closely. Yeah, so it's like yeah. everybody's still <laughs> trying to figure that out. I'm guessing at, at some point, at some point, we'll know the exact one. Because I mean, right? So too. I mean, there's still people trying to figure out because you worked. He, I think he worked on another gimmick. So everybody's trying to figure out which. Which one it is exactly? This is a, it's an astounding story, and you know, only in oh, a, only I mean, coming off all the deaths that happened the last couple of days, this one has to be right up. Yeah, there's been a lot of celebrity deaths lately, uh, from from the mainstream celebrity world to the wrestling celebrity world. Um, I mean, the pitchman Billy Mays. I know, seriously, that one was like considered. I mean, he's all over during wrestling shows too, so. Yeah, he's one you don't expect. Yeah. Now, I, uh, Steve Sims, I want to thank Steve, Dr. Lucha Sims, once again for emailing me the latest YouTube editions of La Peste Negra. Which one, what did you watch? I watched the June 26th uh, match with Casas Niebla and Felino against Mystico, Sombra, and Volodar Jr. Uh-huh. And what thrilled me the most is a few weeks ago when I was on Brian Alvarez's the show, I talked about the bump that uh, made me just fall head over heels over the work of Negro Casas. Mm-hmm. The very first time I ever saw him wrestle in 1985. This is the bump where he uh, does something wicked to his opponent in the middle of the ring, and then he starts to climb up the turnbuckle from the inside of the ring. And then his opponent drop kicks him on the butt, and he goes over the ropes and lands butt first on the floor. Uh-huh. And it's a, it was a wicked looking bump, but when you'd watch him, you could see him taking care of himself by you know lightly breaking the fall with his hand to the apron as he's going down. But it's so it was I wouldn't say subliminals the correct word because he could see it, but it was so subtle that it looked like he just crashed on his ass. And I was so jazzed that in the third fall, he took that bump. I have not seen him take that bump in a while. Wow. He's, uh, looks like he's altered a, a bit. He's gotten oh, he has, wiser as he lands. Yeah, he's, he's a little older now. So. Yeah, he's a little older. Uh, he lands foot first, but still takes the complete fall. It's not like he just lands flat on his feet, but I notice he breaks it with his feet now instead of his butt. And it was my favorite bump to take when I was wrestling. And but, yes, and I was I, a major mark for Negro Casas back then. I haven't watched as much lucha as I would like in the last couple of years, but I am a born again Negro Casas fan. I love watching this guy work every week. And uh, again, thank you for to Steve Sims for pointing me toward this match. I know I got to widen my horizons now and watch a little bit more of what's going on with the other luchadores in CMLL. And Triple uh, A, are we going that far? Will, will you be watching Triple A? Well, let's take it piecemeal. Wait, speaking of Triple A, I got to ask you: Have you have you watched any of it like recently? No, not for several months now. Okay, now I'm going to tell you something you have to watch. Okay. Okay. The first, the first thirty minutes or so, or the first hour, they have this, this. Um, they'll have Gato Volador and Pimpinella tagging. But the whole I, angle, like they've been running this angle for a couple of weeks. Where, really? Um, Pimpinella, they're, 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 You know, they do those mixed tags, right? They do. Yes, I do. 
well, what Pimp- AAA is famous for. Yeah, well, Pimpinella is doing, um, his, his gimmick is that he loves Gato Volador. Oh, that's awesome. So you know what, I mean, you just can't, I don't know how bad that, I mean, that could be like the funniest thing possible, but it could also be like the, I just don't, I just don't know what it'll be like around in um, AAA's hands. You just gave oh, me a reason to start DVRing AAA every week. Yeah, but then wait, this angle gets you. Pimpinella admit that he's he's basically saying that he loves him, and Gato Volador has already uh, has already said. Um, I think it's no, it's Gato Ever Ready. Or what, what's his name? I think it's. Gato I'm Ever-Ready. sorry. What was his name? Gato. Well, it's Gato, Gato Ever Ready. Yeah, Gato Ever Ready. There's like so many Gatos now. Um, well, he basically um, they did a they did an, uh, a big net. Last week, where Fa- Fabio Apache was talking to um, Gato, and he was and he and she was telling him, you know, Pinky loves you and everything. And he's like, I know she does, I know he does, or whatever. And he's like, but I don't love him that way. I love him as a friend. <laughs> oh, so good then, lord! So, so basically, the storyline is now P- Fabio Apache is giving them relationship advice, and you know how ironic that is, right? That yeah, because Fabio Apache basically has the worst relationship. <laughs> In professional wrestling right now. Oh my lord, this rules! I have not seen it yet, but this rules. They'd have, yeah, you to... have to. You have to watch that. It's just one of the strangest things. Okay, okay. now for those people who don't know, who don't know me well out there, Pimpinela Escarlata is my all-time favorite Exotico. I know most people put uh, put Cassandro in the top queen role at the moment. At the moment. Yeah, not all. Pimpinela is my eternal favorite, though. Yeah. Ever since I saw Pimpinela for the first time in an eight-man tag, he was teaming with uh, Mayflowers, Rudy Reina, and La Rosa. It was an old UWA tape, and again, this is something I got courtesy of Steve Sims back in 1991, I believe the year was. And it was one of their rare appearances back then as Technicus. And let me see if I can remember the four guys they were wrestling. One was Shu El Guerrero. One was... Okay, I'm getting lost already here. I think one was Black Terry. It probably had to be that mix, uh, the, the Los Temerarios, wasn't it? Something like that? Yes. Yeah. But... And I, it, when I watched that match, I thought, why in the hell did they even push Exavicos as Rudos? Because they were so over as baby faces that night. And it was a great finish. One, Pimpinela ruled. He was, I know May Flowers back then was pushed as the best Exavico worker, but no way. Pimpinela blew him away. And it was one of those matches that ends with everybody delivering a tope one after the other until there was a pile of seven wrestlers outside of the ring. And the last person inside the ring was Pimpinela. And he didn't just deliver the final Toby. He got in the ring, did this very elegant, you know, this elegant statuesque pose, hands up in the air, and the people were just going nuts for him. And he did the most beautiful Tope over the ropes, and the Exoticos won on a count out. And the whole crowd was chanting, Besos, Besos, afterwards. Yeah. You, you, I mean, I, I'm pretty sure you could sit through the first half hour of um, AAA and call it a day. <laughs> Once, once you get past like the anything past that, it's kind of. I mean, you really have to be a big AAA fan. Dude. But that that angle, I thought you would enjoy that. That yes, I am going to enjoy that. I am going to be setting my DVR tonight, making certain that AAA gets taped. Uh, I am going to watch this with bait with bated breath. You know what I watched this past week? What's that? ECW. I didn't. I know, I know you're, I know you're anti ECW because of zombies. Yeah. They did this, they did this new superstar initiative. I don't know if you heard they did like a 15 man trade or something like between SmackDown and all these other promotions. I heard some rumor about that. I, I try not to listen too closely to what happens in ECW because I've heard some pretty bitchin' stuff is happening on that show, but yeah, there's well, no well, zombies. They they did this. They had this thing where they they're, they're bringing in all this new superstar. It's a new superstar initiative. Yes. It's all, the, it's all those, like, Florida, all the indie guys. Hence the jokes in. I've been hearing about last night on Florida Championship Wrestling. Uh-huh. Yeah. So it's, ba- it's basically just Florida Championship Wrestling, but but it's, it's so weird because they, um, they have, like, 
they it was it was interesting, but then they had like this one segment where um they had this like talk show, and I mean I swear you you could just hear crickets through the whole thing. Painful. Uh, painful. Dude, you can't even get past that point. It's like, how do you get past that point and continue watching? But I, the reason I, I thought it was interesting because um, those cars, Junior and um, Psychedelico Junior, remember they're in um, and they're in Florida right now, or I guess this, those cars, Junior is gonna go into whatever WWE, and I'm thinking he's gonna end up showing up like a, in the next two or three weeks on that show. Interesting. So Cause, they're no, because they debut like four people within the first show. I mean, how much? How many people do they have in FCW? The That's debut one. fascinating. So, so I mean, they're they're throwing Dos Caras Jr. into the I, farm league, more or less. Then. Well, I don't know if he's going to be there, but I'm thinking he's going to. I mean, cause they they had um. <clears throat> oh, what I what I meant, what I was going to tell you, is they had different ethnicities in this whole show. Like there was a guy representing. Like if you were if you're Irish, there's an Irish guy wrestling on that show. If you're Japanese, Hornswoggle. No, she- Seamus. Oh lordy! There's this really big um, uh, red haired like. Like, just imagine Carrot Top, but, like, not as bad-looking as Carrot Top. You know what Carrot Top is, right? That sounds, yeah, and that sounds really cool. Yes, Carrot Top. I do know Carrot Top, and this sounds, I, I, I actually want to watch it. Can't they just, yeah. can't they just throw one flesh-eating monster in there so I can start watching it again? Well, see, that's I need I, a reason. That's what I'm thinking. They're gonna, they have to have a Mexican, so, I mean, at some point, Dos Caras Jr. is going to be the, the Lucha Libre guy. I mean, you can't have a Mexican and not have it be a luchador. And I'll be unable right. to watch it. Yeah, wow. So then you'll see, you'll watch Dos Cars Jr. and Russell, and and you'll be like, okay, maybe I won't watch it. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> maybe I'll wait true. till zombies show up. But you know, you have a guy who looks like Carrot Top. I I want to turn this on, but you know, yeah, he, he even spoke like um, Gaelic. Oh, that's beautiful! And, wow. And then they had at, at the very beginning they had a Japanese guy. Um, I don't know if you remember this guy named um, Yamamoto. Who no, I don't. Japan. He he he's wrestling. They debuted him as Yoshi Tetsu. So he wrestled um, Shelton Benjamin, and all they did, Shelton Benjamin is a racist, basically. That was the whole story. He was mm, the whole okay. angle was him, like you know doing the doing the whole like making fun of Japanese and everything. But, yes. But they they ended up having him win. With wait wait Yamamoto had, or Benjamin? They had the the Yoshi Tetsu winning the match. The Japanese okay, match. got ya. So it was like an upset, but they did the whole like racial. I mean, it's very, it's like ECW is no longer hardcore, it's now racial. <laughs> <laughs> it's now, we're ECW, we're racist. <laughs> we're, no, seriously, we're so, it's like so blatant, like, they, they, even had, they even got Kozlov, is that the guy, the Vladimir Kozlov, right? Yes. The Russian guy? He was wearing red. Wow. Boy, I, I guess it's the promotion that travels back into time. If they could push enough of a retro look, that might work. That might actually work, and all they need is zombies, and like make it a black and white scene when they do bring in the zombie. Yes, yes, as they're just kind of uh, chewing and shaking the entrails everywhere this way, and um, of course, now that we're on the uh, subject of zombies. No, wait, I wanted to wait. Let me just finish telling you about okay. zombies. Okay. My idea for I'll hear. Oh yes, yes. If you have, if you have, you can pitch an idea, idea for zombies. For I'm all ears. Here is my idea for a zombie that they should have done done in honor of Michael Jackson. They should have done the thriller thing. That's point, true. That would have been so apropos. At this point, they had it. They had. They would have had enough zombies to do the the whole thriller dance. You know, the whole dance off. That would be, would have been great. A whole yeah. army of zombies dressed. In the red Michael Jackson jackets from the eighties. There you go. That would have that's been the ultimate send off for Michael. You know the the show the show though it's like their announcing is really boring. I, I have no idea. I don't I, I I don't watch the show as often as I probably could or would. But I mean the, they're, they're like I remember my Matt Stryker wasn't as boring as he was on this show. I mean they, I think it, I think they really are trying to go like retro. Like really? Yeah, old. back in the days, I remember. Uh, I never realized how good I had it when I started watching wrestling on KCOP Channel 13 in 1972, because we had an announcer named Dick Lane, uh-huh. who was a great charismatic play-by-play man who sounded like just firecrackers going off right and left. He sounded so just happy to be alive, and you could have the deadest wrestler in the ring. And he would make you think you were watching, you know, the second coming. On top of that, the ring announcer was Jimmy Lennon. And apologies to all Howard Finkel fans out there, but Jimmy Lennon 
was the was the archetype of ring announcers. Yeah. If you watch a uh, mixed martial arts shows that oppose UFC, you'll see his son Jimmy Lennon Jr., who is almost as good as his papa. But he was in boxing for years too. He's, he, yes. Is, isn't he? Yeah, Jimmy Lennon was a uh, ring announcer for just just about any fight and sport there was. Yeah. Um. The announcing was much better back then. <laughs> yeah, at least, well, if you got the right announcer, but there was, when you talked about Matt Stryker doing the retro thing, yeah. there were also a lot of horrendous announcers, and I bet you don't have to look too far on YouTube to find some uh, some ancient TV wrestling. Oh, I, I, I can't remember the announcer's name, but there was an announcer in Tennessee, obviously not Lance Russell, but he was the deadest announcer you've ever heard, and... Every other every other move was called a, a work your head off move. No, but I mean, it, it, they were they not not only were they like really like like slow and deliberate, they were really quiet. Like they'd be like like there's um there's Yoshi Tetsu. As if somebody handed them a microphone and they're yeah, like, like okay, what do I do with this? I think they were just trying to do like a golf type of thing, you know, like like there he is. <laughs> Could the audience be very quiet for this next move? He might, like, he might he might think it. <laughs> and then you listen to like all these other shows and it's like they're all loud and you know, like even like Lucha, you, you you watch Lucha and it's like all these guys are really loud, except for the independent shows. The independent shows I mean the announcing is horrible on half the shows. But I mean like C M L L Triple A they're all really loud. But then like this show it's like really quiet. Let's, <laughs> let's slow it down. Okay, so getting back to your zombie movie. Oh, my Lord. I had a DVD sitting in my rack for, I think, about, I want to say, at least two years now. Wow. I finally opened up and watched it and found I had this great masterpiece right under my nose. Um, now, when you think of zombies, do you think mostly the flesh-eating genre of zombies? Uh-huh. Those are, well, the, those are the first I think about. Yeah, and those are the most popular. Yeah, popular. But before George Romero created the first flesh-eating zombie in the late 1960s, there were a whole slew of zombie films where they're not so much mindless flesh-eaters or you know people who wanted to pop open somebody's head and eat their brains. There were a slew of zombie movies where a voodoo curse was put upon a person or a whole city of people where they would be in a zombie trance. Basically basically the same concept. The dead are brought back to life, but they're focused. They are commanded to kill or kidnap. And generally, you know, they obey their master's command. They're like hypnotized zombies. They're not craving the flesh, but, you know, most of them like to strangle or hack people's heads off if commanded. Well, the DVD I had is called Blood of the Zombie. And the date was 1963, so I knew going into this, this is not going to be you know, a great blood feast. <laughs> this will be the zombie under somebody else's command. So I was ready for that. And the film itself, Blood of the Zombie, how do I put this? It's not that that film embraced me necessarily. Boy, I'm stumbling over my words tonight. <laughs> You're like, I don't really... I'm turning into a zombie myself. It was this bad that it turned you into a zombie. <laughs> Pretty much. Actually, the, the director of the film was a guy named Barry Mahone, who who was fascinating in his own right. He was in the rare Royal Air, Air Force in Britain during World War II, was a prisoner of war, and it's rumored that the movie The Great Escape, one of the characters, was fashioned after his POW adventures. Whether that's true or not, I don't know. But I think he served his country a little better than he served the film industry. Nonetheless, this guy was fascinating. And Blood of the Zombie was his take on zombies New Orleans style. The first 20 minutes of the film is the most fascinating piece as it's basically a trip through a New Orleans strip club. 
there's this uh, this show business manager who just got married to this cute little brunette gal. So what does he do on their wedding night? Hey, I want to show you New Orleans. So he takes her to strip clubs and jazz clubs. You know, the, the thing you do on most honeymoons. Uh-huh. And I heard I've never been married, so. <laughs> yeah, well, on your honeymoon, I, I don't advise. I, 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 I recommend you don't take your. Uh, don't don't go to don't go. Don't go to strip clubs with your wife. Oh. I don't think it will start off the marriage on a good foot. I know there's a lot of people in Vegas, a lot of the MMA crowd, who will probably disagree with me. Um. Thanks for the advice. Kurt. Well, I don't want to focus too much on the blood of the zombie plot. Uh-huh. Uh huh. The best part of it is there's only one zombie. And it's uh, the body of a woman who lives on a plantation. And she's scared she's going to lose the plantation to her cousin, who is the showbiz manager. Uh And uh, so she raises her dead brother, who, if this wasn't 1963, I would swear that they were just trying to do a spoof on Keith Richards. This zombie looked so much like Keith Richards. It was hysterical. Pretty tepid flick. And there's actually only, you know, one killing that the zombie, uh, you know, commits. And one killing in the whole movie. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Just, what? you know, the only, the only other people who get killed are the woman who controls the zombie and the zombie himself. Oh. But yeah, but the zombie only really, he's not such a bad zombie. He, he kills one person and he ends up killing the wrong person too. He's commanded to kill the wife of the show business manager, but... Nah, he goofed. Um, and ironically, he kills the coolest character of the film. I don't know what Barry Mahone was thinking. But the treat, the real treat in this DVD release was when I looked at the menu, there was a little uh, thumbnail that said Voodoo Swamp. Now, I looked on the cover of the DVD and I looked everywhere. I looked at the description on the back for a description of this voodoo swamp. I find nothing. <laughs> there, you know, it was just like a little incidental on the, you know, disc menu. Like it was put there by accident or something. So I said, let's see what voodoo swamp is. And oh my gosh, this is the best kept secret in bad filmmaking. This throws Plan 9 from Outer Space off its throne as the worst movie of all time. <laughs> I Voodoo Swamp is a movie that was obviously never quite completed. It also takes place in New Orleans. And it's similar to the plot of Blood of the Zombie. The only problem is half the time you don't understand what the plot is. There's also this evil woman in New Orleans who who raises people from the dead to do her command. The only thing is, you never understand why she's raising people from the dead. The only good explanation of why she rose somebody from the dead... Oh, and incidentally, there are only two zombies in this movie, too. (laughs) But this is so much cooler than Blood of the Zombie, because you see that this evil woman had some smarts as one of the zombies is this big hulking bodybuilder that looks like her own personal Rocky horror. And 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 this big zombie turned out to become governor of California, right? Uh, yeah, well, that's the funny part. This <laughs> movie a, looks like it was, was probably shot around the early 60s. And this guy looks steroided out like before many people were steroided out. Yeah, before Schwarzenegger. Yes, exactly. Yeah, yeah, BS before Schwarzenegger. That's a good way of putting it. (laughs) What was beautiful about this movie, it was so shoddily put together that when a scene would fade out, it didn't fade out. The scene bleached out to where it looks like the film was on fire and is overlapped by the next scene of the movie. This happens continually throughout the movie. And the greatest part is they must have messed up the audio fiercely over and over again throughout this film because there were times when people's lips would move with the audio and other times where you would hear audio but their faces were turned away or they they were off sync. Like a Kung Fu movie. 
<laughs> this was even better than a kung fu movie. This, you know, they actually missed the whole thing. The yeah, whole the, voice. the voices sounded like cartoon characters from like an old Yogi Bear or Flintstones cartoon. The dialogue was the best part, and one little area of the plot just swept me up, and that is where all the voodoo people meet and fall under the spell of this priestess. Where do most uh, voodoo uh, priests gather to do uh, the the bewitching of the occult? And that is, of course, an apartment where beatniks hang out. It's not the swamp? It's not the swamp. It's an apartment where beatniks beat on bongos, and one of the women dances exotically. The The greatest part is when you hear a description of uh, of the beatnik scene. There's a detective who is trying to find the sister of a missing New Orleans woman, and he's going from bar to bar and runs into his old friend Randy, and he asks his friend Randy what he knows, what he knows about this girl Vicky. And this is a pretty hard job looking detective in the Raymond Chandler uh, vein. He. He asks his friend, what do you know? And his friend's dialogue is great. He says, I went to this apartment, man. This bunch of beat characters. Way out, like, you know, man? <laughs> Outsville. You know, I went, to the, I went to their pad two, no, three times. And then I shook the joint. Some of these characters are like, weirdo. Voodoo. And man, that ain't the half of it. And he says, one thing I don't dig is weird stuff. And this gal, Vicky, was strictly from Straitsville, so I'm out. Outsville. And then after he delivers this brilliant dialogue, the hard job detective says, well, your, word, your word's good enough for me. <laughs> and, you know, this movie is both good acid and bad acid. And I wish I really prepared better to give you a description of this film. I know I'm stumbling over this, but I urge everybody to go to Amazon.com, pick up a DVD copy of Blood Blood of the Zombie. It was released under an alternate title uh, through something weird video called The Dead One. And this is a rarity. Do not go to something weird video's release of this movie because they do not include Voodoo Swamp in it. You can only get that if you get Blood of the Zombie. And like I said, nowhere on the artwork on the DVD can you find reference to Voodoo Swamp. So you got a bonus disc, basically. Yes, it is a bonus. It is a gem that I didn't know I had. This movie is the best-kept secret. When I got done watching this, I immediately surfed the Internet trying to find information on it. It does not even have a listing of, on Internet Movie Database which is a shocker because they every have. movie, no matter how lost it is, is on Internet Movie Database. Do you know what movie is on Internet Movie Database? An what old porn flick called Bat Pussy. <laughs> no, they actually do. A, they, they, they have porn on there also. Yeah, they do. They do. Yeah, and they, the they movie do, Bat Pussy, Bat yeah. Pussy, which you can get excerpts of on YouTube, about a woman dressed as Batwoman, Going, you know, traveling everywhere on one of those little, uh, what are those little balls called when we were kids? Those hoppity hops. Oh yeah, the oh yeah, I remember those. I had one. I don't remember what it was. Yeah, so did I. That that was probably the cheesiest movie of all time made, and that has a presence on internet internet movie database. And so that tells you Voodoo how Swamp does not. I found a little information on it, but it's all sketchy. None of the actors or actresses are identified in it, probably with good reason, but. One source says it is another work by Barry Mahone. It looks like it's the same era. It looks like it could be his work. But I would love to know more. And if any of you uh, out there who are patient enough to listen to me ramble on about this great movie, email me, Liger, L-Y-G-E-R, at AOL.com, and enlighten me if you know anything about this movie. I know the chances are slim. You're gonna you're gonna start getting um, zombie fans hooked on hooked to your website. <laughs> I certainly hope yeah. so. You're um, gonna write about zombies so they could start visiting your website. 
Yeah, in fact, I really have to do a written a written uh, coverage of this film because I'm butchering it verbally. I need to write about this. This film must be known. This film is a combination of good acid and bad acid. I mean, the the scenes of New Orleans and the the you know overly blighted colors are just magnificent to watch, and and the horrible dialogue is a gem. There's a few disturbing scenes where they're in the middle of these swamps in New Orleans and they see a wild pig who is about the size of a poodle and they shoot the pig, you know, because this wild pig's endangering them. And it's disturbing because you can tell this is like real footage of this poor pig being shot in cold blood. Oh. They also shoot a couple of snakes in cold blood. That's the other gem about this movie. Every time somebody falls asleep, they wake up to find a cotton mouth or a rattlesnake right in their face. Now, I, I don't know much about nature. I try to stay away from nature unless it involves the beach and body surfing. No, no, no wild animals around that. No wild animals, but even, even I'm not dim enough to think that snakes are going to go looking for you hunting for you, unless they're like a python or a boa constrictor. That's a whole other story. You know what I was going to ask you? Cause I, did you ever see the Hollywood Blondes, the Jerry Brown? Um, yes, I did. You saw them live, right? I never got to see them live, but I did watch them every week on TV, and they were, along with their manager, Sir Oliver Humperdinck, they were one of the greatest heel teams I have ever seen. Buddy yeah. Roberts was such an underrated worker. I got, I got the... I got the the, the box set for um, that old Japanese promotion, IWE. Yes. Uh, and, and they're on there. <laughs> and I was like, oh, my God. That's, that's really? Blonde. Yeah. I would love to see that. You, if have, you, could... you have them doing all the whole thing. But I was, because yeah. I've seen Jerry Brown before. But, I mean, every time I see him, I always think Chico and the man. <laughs> I always think of the man. You know, Chico and the man, the man. Every the funniest thing when I think of Jerry Brown is along the lines of what you're saying is I know somebody who was friends with him years ago, uh-huh. and that person, when he'd drink too much, would bring up Jerry Brown and say, that man, God was so mean to him. He's the nicest man in the world, and God made him so ugly. Why? <laughs> and he was dead serious, too. This wasn't said as a joke. <laughs> but You know, the other thing I know is with Buddy Roberts was really good. You know, I mean, Buddy Roberts was such a great worker. I... In he fact, had, I remember... He had everything, the look and everything with it. He but, did. He had it down. He he was like the perfect... He was like the quintessential tag team wrestler yeah. of the 70s. You could have teamed him up with anybody. Because I remember reading about the Hollywood Blondes when I was a kid, and I would be like, I, I wonder what these guys look like. And, and I, I, I think I saw a picture of them, and I was like, Jerry... You know, first of all, I, thought, I was shocked at seeing Jerry, Jerry Brown looking kind of not so Hollywood blonde. <laughs> well, that was the funny thing, is when the Hollywood Blondes came in... You know, Buddy Roberts was perfect for the for the part, but here was Jerry Brown, who had bleach blonde hair, but these big shaggy eyebrows and this big honking nose, like the late Carl Malden. May he rest in peace. I know. Oh, there's another one. That's, that's there's another one who just passed, Carl Malden, and 97 years old. 97. He died that's too a, young. <laughs> yeah, that's a good run. He died too young. But, but Jerry Brown, um, he did not look the part, but he still pulled it off, and. Oliver Humperdinck was was a great pitchman for them. He would just he would piss people off uh, every week. He would be on there, and Judo Jean Labelle was the locker room interview uh-huh. host. And every week, Oliver Humperdinck would remind Jean Labelle that we just don't like you, Jean. We don't like you. Like we're going to be at a party next week, but you're not coming because we do not like you. You never give a reason for it. But just drive it home, and Gene Lodell would just have this very stern look, like he wanted to wanted to, you know, say something witty back, but he couldn't because he was an honorable honorable announcer. There you go. Did, did they ever feud with? Or they feuded with Black Gordon and Grand Goliath, didn't they? Yes, they did. They the Hollywood oh, Blondes one. came into Los Angeles in 1974, um, and if I recall, they started feuding with Victor Rivera and Dino Bravo, who were a tag team at the time. Uh-huh. And they began, if I remember correctly, they began feuding with Gordon and Goliath in the summer of 1975. And the angle was Louis Talley, who booked the territory and also pushed himself through the roof as a wrestler, 
<laughs> surprise, surprise. Any 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 wrestler that can still walk or at least, you know, pretty much, you know, I don't know, like, not die in the ring. <laughs> if he's the Booker, he'll push. Yeah, him. he'll he'll last. He'll stay yeah. in the ring as long as he can. Yeah, Louis Tele was. Yeah, Louis Tele should not have pushed himself. But there were some pretty cool uh, angles, and one of the angles was he had had enough of the Hollywood blondes, and so he brought in Gordon and Goliath, who were, uh, you know, known as heels in L.A. Uh-huh. They were heels just the year before, feuding with Victor Rivera and Raul Mata. But he brought them in uh, as baby faces, but as like the most badass baby faces you'll ever see. And he'd have them just trash the Hollywood blondes. And I wish I could have seen those live. Could you they they worked it very well because they would shoot angles on TV, but they would not they would not have the blondes wrestle Gordon and Goliath on TV. They still saved it for the Friday night shows. So you never got to see the action? No, never got to see those. Ah, yeah. The opposite was true once Roddy Piper came in in 1976 and began feuding with Chavo Guerrero. Yeah. This is how horribly mismanaged the L.A. territory was at that point. It started off with Piper and Guerrero having a wonderful feud. I mean, great heat. Uh, they did a great angle where... Uh, Chavo and Piper were wrestling under scientific rules, which meant you couldn't hit anybody or, you know, choke on the ropes. You know, what... Yeah. In other words, you had to have a really dead match. Uh-huh. Well, the angle was that Piper uh, took a powder from the ring and smacked Glory Guerrero at ringside, which caused Chavo to become enraged and uh, start wailing on Piper, thus getting disqualified and losing his coveted Jewel Strongbow Scientific Trophy. <laughs> and actually, it got over really well until Chavo grabbed the mic and screamed up into heaven, Mr. Strongbow, I am so sorry for what I just did, how I shamed you. <laughs> Despite that, it was a good feud. The problem and then the is... People start laughing, right? Of co- oh, yeah. 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 yeah that. And they laugh even more later when they uh, brought in Lars Anderson as the bionic wrestler. Oh, great. But w- the problem was, is... Chavo Guerrero and Roddy Piper started wrestling each other, not just on the big Friday night shows, but on all the televised shows, too. And I joke not when I said, this Friday night, you fans can see it only here at the Olympic Auditorium, Chavo Guerrero versus Roddy Piper. And then what was the main event on TV that very night when they're pushing Chavo Guerrero versus Roddy Piper? Chavo Guerrero and Roddy Piper. Versus Roddy Piper. It well, was that, really, that, really bad. Well, that's, I, that's what I notice with like the pay-per-views now in, in WWE and even TNA and all those other companies. Like their pay-per-views don't really end anything. Yeah, you know? and it feels like you're watching an episode of Raw. And you're paying fifty bucks for that, and then you have to watch the next show, and that's when the show, the angle, and it, sometimes it won't even end. Like the Cena Big Show thing just kept going and going and going, you know. So. That's the thing. That's what I think. Like even with like AAA and all that stuff, they do. They have a habit of doing that too. Which... It reminds me of the last few seasons of the seasons of The Sopranos, where it seemed like they were winging it every episode. Like, what are we going to do this week? Kill somebody. Well, else. let's have Tony Soprano go into a dream world and get beaten up by Buddhist monks. I don't know. I I, I think the only stuff I actually remember from Sopranos was the the part where um where Buscemi was in for that brief like what was it like for a season. Yeah, that was probably the the last, well, speaking of angles, that was probably the last good angle they did, but it seemed like they were winging it those last few yeah. episodes. And everybody, you know, the Emperor had no clothes. We were all pretending to still like it. So so, so how were, how, do you do you remember what they were like in the ring, um, the Hollywood, Hollywood Blondes, or were they really that good, or? As I recall, I was 13 years old at the time, and so... You weren't into work rate back then. <laughs> I didn't understand work yeah. rate. I understood. What I understood is these guys were great heat builders every week. I mean, I would get pissed off. I mean, that was, in fact, that was the era where I was starting to really like the heels. Yeah. But the Hollywood Blondes, I was still getting pissed off at. That's how good a heels they were. Yeah, the, 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 the cool thing is, like, they're in Japan, and they're still doing all the stuff they would normally do, like, in the U.S. Because I've seen, I've seen, like, stuff where they're... I guess they're like splitting up towards the end of the blondes run. Oh, I've seen stuff like that, but like this, the stuff in Japan, 
they're 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 still doing all that stuff like where they'll take off their glasses, they'll hug, you know, their sunglasses. Yeah, they did all that. They would do that every match. Yeah, they're doing that there, and then like you'll hear Buddy Roberts yelling at the fans like, "Shut up! I'm trying to do something." And all this stuff. <laughs> and they, they do this one spot where um, the, the beginning of the match is Jerry Brown and one of the I can't remember who the other guy is. Let me check. The other guy was the Japanese guy was. Uh, I can't remember. Well, when the Thunder Japanese Sugawara. Guy, well, it was either um, it was either Tura. There's like there's only like six Japanese guys in IWE for some reason because they were getting like Rush or Kimura. Yeah, it was Kobayashi. Yeah, Shoujo Kobayashi or Great Kusatsu. Yeah, Shoujo Kobayashi. I remembered is the biggest dull man in the business. He he was so bland and just lacked any kind of charisma. He was like the anti charisma. Well, he's the one that's in with um, with um, Buddy when Buddy Roberts comes in, and Buddy Roberts is getting ready to lock up with him. And right when they're when, when they're trying to do it, Buddy Roberts gets cl- as close as possible to his corner. And when he gets there, um, Jerry Brown's leaning right toward right over the re- uh, over the top rope, and he's just looking at getting closer, getting a closer look. And as he gets closer, that's when uh, Kobayashi just punches him <laughs> in the face and knocks him down. <laughs> so I'm, I, I just got a kick out of that angle. That's that, great. That, that that's awesome. great. One of the uh, best compliments I ever heard paid to Buddy Roberts was in the, I think it was 1984, I I got to work out with a guy by the name of Mickey Doyle, who is probably one of the greatest wrestlers that most people today have never heard of. He yeah. was a journeyman, came out of Detroit and wrestled here in L.A. and in the Northwest. Very, very smooth, talented worker. And when he was uh, when he was training me, I remember the two wrestlers he kept pointing to were Buddy Roberts and Harley Race. And at one point he said, if you've been wrestling for a while and you cannot have a decent match with Buddy Roberts or Harley Race, quit the business. Wow. Because those guys are the masters of carrying people. Yeah, and if, I mean, if, if they can't carry you, then you have no place in the business. You, you just hear all these stories about Harley Race, but Buddy Roberts doesn't really get mentioned as much. He yeah, he, well, he's... Everybody remembers he, him as that drunk free bird, you know. The and he was great guy. in that role, too. I, I mean, and there's there's no crime. There's no nothing bad about being a supporting player. It's like all the great character actors of the 50s and 60s that I see on TV. You know, they were never good enough to carry a, a show by themselves, but they were still great. And you know, the, the, the cool thing about Buddy Roberts was, like, when you're a kid and you're watching the free birds, you always thought, man, I really hate that guy. I just want them to kick his butt. And you always assumed he was the one that was going to get beat up. And every week he'd, get, he'd be like, I remember the the mid South. They did that angle where the Fantastics just beat the crap out of him, and he he promised they, that his big brother was going to come over and kick their ass. And that's when <laughs> were, like two weeks later, Terry Gordy would come back from Japan and just show up all of a sudden and just just pile drive them dur- right after a match or during a match. <laughs> and you know that was sweet. Like, that that was that that's what always made the Freebirds just that ideal trio. Which they were they were the ideal trio, and yeah. especially emphasized with the uh, Von Erich feud. Yeah, that was a golden age of. That was when I began getting tapes from you know other areas. You know, years before DVR and that sort of thing. I would wait with bated breath you know, when I got my first VCR because I would get uh, masks uh, uh, matches of Tiger Mask from Japan. And Freebirds from World Class. Those were the wow. two things I looked forward to. Uh, the World Class TV in the 1983-84 was great. Yeah, I mean, I remember when when I first moved here and everybody would, because this is so Kellen, I, I remember everybody would be talking about WWF. Like, if you talk about old wrestling, it was always WWF. And then you would talk about, like, all this other stuff. And people were like, really? We never, we really didn't get to watch all that stuff. And I even knew people who uh, would claim to be in the know who would refuse to watch a Georgia wrestling or Mid-South. They said just because it's not WWF, it's second class. And yeah, cause I, re- I mean, I remember just, like, when I would come over and visit during the summer, I would be, I would be talking about, I, w- I watched in, 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 in El Paso, I would watch Lucha, I would watch World Class, Florida Championship Wrestling, like it was on for about a, a summer. Um, the NWA would be on, Mid South, and over here, you'd, all you'd get was WWF and I think California, one of those California wrestling shows. Yes, and it seemed like half of these shows uh, all aired on Channel Fifty Six here in Anaheim. <laughs> yeah, unless you got unless you could have cable, 
which you could get NWA over here, I think. At oh, yeah, yeah. I, uh, I, re- I would not have an antenna TV after 1983. I had to have my cable, I, you know. Because I think I you mean, get Lucha here, too, but, I, I mean, I never... I mean, I yeah, I didn't get Lucha until 1989, which was not a bad year to get Lucha on a Galavision because that was a great year. What, what was the first Lucha match you, wa- you remember watching? The very first Lucha match. But this will probably bore the hell out of people, but so I'll try to put it in a nutshell. But when I started watching wrestling on Channel 13 in 1972... There was also Lucha Libre on Channel 22. Uh, this was several months before they started airing Titanes and El Ring from Argentina. And, you know, I was a typical 10-year-old. I didn't want to bother to watch something in Spanish because I couldn't understand it. But one night, uh, Channel 13 Wrestling was preempted for a college football game. So I said, well, I'll check out this stuff on Channel 22. And it blew my mind. It was a black and white TV show. I have no idea where it was from. It was definitely not Arena Coliseo. It was not Arena Mexico. This was like a small place that seated maybe 2,000, 3,000 people. And the opening match was a singles with uh, some character you know, dressed up similar to Mil Moscaris in the Aztec garb uh-huh. and some bleach blonde pretty boy. And it was a shocker for me because on Channel 13, all of the matches back then were one fall, four rounds. They would have, I can't remember if it was three-minute rounds or five-minute rounds. So when I started watching wrestling, I thought all wrestling was done on the round system, like in boxing. So this match was going like 20 minutes straight. And I'm like, whoa, this is a long match. And uh, all I can remember is that the, the blonde heel went over got really good heat, and then it was followed by a tag team match. And the heels in the tag team match were a masked duo that looked like the kind of clowns you would see in your worst nightmare. They had these very sad, tragic-looking faces for masks. And their opponents were these two masked men who had bat ears, similar to Batman, but they had these spots on their masks that made it look like they broke out in hives or had the measles or something. <laughs> Leopard bats. Yes, and that was the first time I saw actual lucha-style wrestling. And, again, I was 10 years old, so I sat there saying, whoa, this wrestling is different. The way these guys dive and soar over each other, it blew my mind. Wow. Um, and I was, a little, I was a little put off by it, I think, because of the nightmarish masks. You weren't put off of it by the style? No, I like the style. In fact, the first thing I thought of was all of these all of these guys on this show wrestle a lot like Raul Mata. Raul Mata was a mid card babyface in Los Angeles, who uh, was the first person I ever saw do the Rana, or or if '90s fans prefer, I'll call it the Frankensteiner. But he did a beautiful Rana. And he was a very dynamic Mexican-style babyface who actually worked really well with uh, the American wrestlers. But, you know, I thought, wow, I feel like I'm watching a show with a whole bunch of Raul Matas on it. Wow. So that was my introduction to Lucha. Wow. When was this, like, mid-70s? Uh, 1972. Did you ever figure out who, what, what, where this was from, or you did? I wish. I would... was... It, Me- it was Mexico, though, or... It could have I assume it was Mexico. Yeah. At 10 years old, I wouldn't know Mexico from Colombia, from Venezuela. It could have been anywhere. It was probably, I, it was probably L.A. <laughs> that would be funny if it was. It was probably <laughs> that would be funny. That was around the time when L.A. started really building an independent lucha scene when uh, they would the run at the event. Arena Center on Whittier Boulevard in East L.A. Was it in and, black and white? <laughs> what's that? Was it in black and white, the show? Yes, it was. Oh, it was? Wait, 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 wait. No, i got to tell you, I assume it was, because I had... <laughs> oh, you're going to think so I'm such a retard. It was, it, was, it was a black and white TV I had, so... Well, well to be fair, back back in the in the early 80s, I mean, if you even had a color TV, remember, if you didn't have, if you didn't have the antennas on properly, it would go to black and white. Yeah, that's true. That's true. And I remember when we did get a t- color TV back then, Titanes and El Ring was always in black and white. 
even though it was I, the biggest TV, one of the biggest TV shows in Argentina. Because I remember watching Lucha like still in like '85, and it would still be like in black and white because it was the UHF channel, you know. Because you, you'd always have to start messing around with. Yes, the, in fact, I have memories of being at my grandparents' house and being very angry because on Saturday nights, I wanted to watch my Channel 13 wrestling, and at that time, the biggest sitcom in the nation was All in the Family. So at 8 o'clock, in the the good color TV at my grandparents' house, the whole family would watch All in the Family on color TV, and I had to go out into the spare bedroom, <laughs> and on the little black and white TV, try to get in Channel 13, and it was snowy, and the picture would get all, you know, the, the horizontal hold would go off. That, I would be so angry. Going on, that was still going on all the way up to, like, 89, 90, I mean... That's, that's oh, it was the cause of my, my greatest heel promos. I could never replicate them in the ring. But when I was in that bedroom trying to tune in the picture for championship wrestling, I would be cursing up a storm. Like, God damn it, they have to watch their stupid owl in the family. I just want to watch them wrestling. God damn it, I think Bondo Lopez really will beat Gordon Nelson this time. But I can't see it. Oh, Gordon Nelson's on that, on that DVD, too. He's on one of those um, in that box set. Fredo, this is cool. Okay, this is the IWE uh, Japan promotion, yeah. right? Yeah, the IWG in Japan. They have a bunch of AWA guys. They have um, Billy Robinson. They have Andre when he was younger. Don oh, Robinson. this is, this is something you should be plugging right here. On Rashi. Well, yeah, I'm probably going to have a sale tomorrow, too. So, so people, slambamjam.com. Fredo yeah, has yeah. some classic IWE Japan. Sale, 4th of July sale, coming up tomorrow, probably. Yeah, celebrate uh, our country's uh, independence by buying Japanese wrestling. <laughs> yeah. Speaking Don't of which, it's July 4th. Don't be racist. So the, first, the, so the first quiz to all of you out there. I'll give you the answer in about 20 seconds, but who wrote our national anthem? No, it was not Francis Scott Key. It was Chuck Berry, Chuck living Berry. in the USA. That is our country's national anthem. That star-spangled banner does not cut it. So that's the next thing you have to buy on Amazon.com. The, 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 what was that, the Rocky one, wasn't it? The, What's that? Was that on Rocky, the, the star-spangled, what was it? Remember he did oh, you're thinking of James Brown living James in America. Brown. Yeah, yeah, James Brown. Yeah, That's Chuck Berry. This is way. This is no no uh, disrespect to uh, Jane, James Brown, musical genius, but oh, Chuck really? Berry just smoked it all. Oh. Yes, I'm so glad I'm living in the USA. Why don't you sing it? I'll, I'll, we got one minute left. Why don't you sing that? <laughs> <laughs> well, I disgraced myself on Brian Alvarez's show by theming, uh, singing the theme to Martin Cara the Gian. Uh, but, of course, replacing it with Super Chico, who is the king of Tulalip Championship Wrestling. Yeah, there you go. And here it is, the final minute of the show. You, you know, I must get it. warmed up better next week because I started out really sluggish and slow, and I'm just starting to get on fire right now. Oh, we, got, we kind of started getting really good at towards the end. We gotta, you know what we should do is probably... We should start the show and not actually start talking till about the 30-minute mark. <laughs> I like that idea. Like so it, people, just... you could see opening, you could hear opening matches with our rest holes before the show actually starts, yeah, and then we'll the start build. the show, and yeah, we'll be all warmed up. That would be we're, great. We're, we're actually geared, we're built for a 90-minute show, actually. If you That's very it. cool. But we probably wouldn't, we probably shouldn't do that. We'll blow up. We'll get we'll blown blow up. up. So... We're, we're like Conan. <laughs> we're, we're the Conan That's right. of podcasting. We'll get up. At, yeah, we'll get in there and we'll blow we'll up. Conan on the show. That would be wonderful. You and Conan. I would love to talk it up with Conan. I'm sure he could set me straight about several things. Yeah, they could ask him, "Why do you hate Blue Panther?" <laughs> <laughs> Wait, do does Conan hate Blue Panther? Well, does I Conan mean, hate Blue? Pa I, I never knew that. Everybody assumes that's why he's not in like the Hall of Fame of you know Meltzer's Hall of Fame or whatever. Oh, I, I I never gave that a thought, really. Uh, well, I mean, how can you like, how can you hate Blue Panther? That's what I want to ask. I think it's more of just like, uh, you know, personal thing, not a legit, not a professional thing. It's more yeah, of a personal a hatred. Thing. Yeah. Well, maybe we'll get a chance know, I mean, to ask Conan one of these days. Maybe we could ask Steve Sim. Yes, we Steve Sim. If you're out there listening to us, will you be on our show next week, please? <laughs> 
We're we'll, begging we'll answer you. His phone call We're begging you. you. You could help carry this show. Steve Sims, you could be the Negro Casas of podcasting. You could carry this show, baby. <laughs> Get in there you and help us dance. Cuatro Cuarenta. I can't pronounce that. every podcast from now on. Yeah. we like Steve Sims podcasting specials. That's right. Well, folks, if you tune in next week, I will, uh, on my part, be better prepared. Fredo was actually well prepared, prepared this I was prepared. time around. I was a mess in this one. I, you know, if Johnny Legend is listening, no, I swear I did not touch any cough syrup. I promise you. I can plug my Twitter account. I mean, how 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 good is that? Seriously. Oh, keep that Twitter I, account open. I'm going to have to get on Twitter now. If you're on Twitter, I got to get on Twitter. <laughs> yes. Let's see you. I I would like to see how often you update that. Uh, yes. Now, Fredo, plug plug your sites. Oh, okay. My website, for all the latest Lucha news, visit luchaworld.com. And DVDs tomorrow will probably be starting the 4th of July sale over at slambamjam.com. And Kurt, your website? www.standtheembryo.com. And if you go there right now, not only can you find all my terribly shallow uh, ramblings, you can see a trailer for one of Barry Mahone's movies that came out in 1969 called, what is it, The Land of Oz. Now, Barry Mahone did a lot of uh, wonderful flicks, uh, you know, a lot of nudie flicks, a lot of, uh, you know, horrifying flicks, and then he finished up his career by making... Uh, making some movies like uh, Thumbelina, Jack and the Beanstalk. Well, go to StandTheEmbryo.com, and the very first thing you'll see is the trailer for his wonderful Land of Oz, and you'll see where Halloween got his inspiration, and you you know, will run in fear afterwards. Go there, folks. This is Alfredo Esparza and me, Vandal Drummond, Saying farewell, and until next week, if you're walking through Southern California and you see a white light streaking across the sky, it is not a shooting star. It is a handful of Monsil's powder. See you all next week. See you next week, Kurt.